Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, today is uh, Hedera's fifth webinar for the DLT and blockchain in the real world series. Uh, we created this series originally to highlight uh, how public distributed ledgers and specifically Hedera Hashgraph help solve uh, real world problems in applications across various industries using Hedera Hashgraph and blockchain technology. Uh, in our past webinars, we've learned about a variety of different companies across different industries, healthcare, agriculture, advertising, and more that are using Hedera Hashgraph uh, to solve problems around data integrity. And you can check out these webinars on our YouTube channel. In today's webinar, we're going to be learning about how Hedera is used uh, at Proven DB to bolster the integrity of document rights and management and offering trusted and immutable versioning uh, while helping companies meet regulatory compliance through a number of different services that they offer. My name is Brady Gentile. I'm on the product marketing team here at Adara. And uh, today we're joined by Guy Harrison, who's the CTO and founder of Proven DB. Um, Guy, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Thanks, Brady. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm, I'm Guy Harrison. I'm the founder of Proven DB and CTO. Um, I'm a sort of a database guy going way, way back, longer than I care to admit. Um, worked with database technologies such as Oracle, MySQL, um, Postgres, um, MongoDB. Um, written a fair few books on database technologies. And um, over the past, so I'd say four years, I've become intensely interested in how blockchains and databases can work together to sort of like get us to the future, really, and how databases can take advantage of blockchain and distributed ledger technology and how um, and how the, some of the things we've learned about databases can um, can enhance our our capabilities with um, these newer technologies and if you can't if you can't tell I'm based in Melbourne Australia awesome thanks for that background guy I appreciate it and uh, looking forward to learning uh, a bunch from you today about proven DB um, so uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we'll leave some time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of Zoom where you can uh, drop your question and answers in. And we'll make sure to uh, ask Guy all of those at the end of the day. Um, and uh, we expect the webinar to be around 30 minutes or so. Uh, and it just kind of depends on how many questions we get. But we're going to try and um, answer everyone's. So uh, let's get started. Um, to kick things off, since we have a number of new people who are joining, uh, I'm going to give a quick overview at the beginning of this presentation uh, about Hedera Hashgraph and some of our network services. And then I'm going to pass things off to Guy, and he's going to talk about uh, the architecture of ProvenDB and uh, also provide a bit of a demo for everyone. All right, so uh, over the past five or six decades, the way that we've shared important information and transferred value has uh, evolved. So we went from documenting very important transactions and pieces of information on paper and mailing it around and notarizing it. And uh, it was a very manual process. Uh, as time progressed, we entered a digital era of mainframes and computers and uh, the ability to generate that information uh, and the speed at which we generated that information has increased. Uh, beyond that, we connected those computers to the internet uh, in around 2000, that was the internet era. Uh, we had web applications and applications that made access and collaboration on that data uh, very easy as well. Um, at that point in time, we still didn't fully have trust in the data, you still had to uh, find notaries or have these intermediaries that created trust in, uh, in this information. Uh, but, uh, you know, just recently entering the blockchain era, this technology allows us to create programmatic trust for our data and assets. So we validate and mathematically prove all of this information. And specifically with Hedera, we can do that very inexpensively. Uh, so when Hedera first started, we identified that there were four main requirements for adoption of blockchain in the mainstream. And those requirements were performance, security, stability, and governance. Uh, from a performance perspective, you need to be able to transact quickly with certainty, and the network needs to be able to support applications that are running at web scale. 
uh, you also have to be able to trust that the network is going to be attack resistant. The platform needs to be stable. So preventing forks of the network is a very important aspect of this stability functionality. Uh, application builders don't want to have to split the state of their application into two competing networks and utilize two cryptocurrencies. Um, and then a strong decentralized governance. So uh, a fully decentralized governing body is foundational to uh, a decentralized network. And they make decisions on code changes and uh, the direction and integrity of the network. So all four of these have to be met to achieve mainstream adoption. And uh, related to performance and security, uh, most of the applications uh, today are running on uh, Hedera consensus service, and they're doing so for data authenticity. And this includes the proven DB application that we'll be learning about today. And this service uh, essentially acts as a scalable and decentralized messaging bus. So you can log very important uh, events or pieces of information to Ledger to make them verifiable, auditable, and transparently available across various parties. Uh, and you can do so in real time. Uh, the Hedera consensus service takes advantage of uh, the native speeds and security and efficiency of the network's underlying Hashgraph consensus algorithm. And that's what makes Hedera very unique uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the public distributed ledger space. Uh, the Hedera consensus service offers uh, three very important uh, functionalities and benefits. Uh, the first being real-time data. So uh, as mentioned before, transactions on Hedera are logged in real time, and this makes it uh, accessible to everyone in real time. Uh, there's verifiable transactions, so you can grant any sort of regulatory body the ability to go and verify the authenticity of documents or any stakeholder who uh, needs to see that that information is accurate. And then it's low cost, too, because of Hashgraph consensus, being able to log or hash information about uh, files or about pieces of data is very efficient and inexpensive when compared to other public networks that are out there. Uh, in terms of governance, because Hedera is a public network, it needs to be governed in a decentralized way. So the governing model that was chosen for Hedera was actually based off of uh, the model that was chosen for uh, Visa. And the governing body consists of 39 leading global organizations. They uh, own the Hedera LLC individually, and they operate network nodes. Uh, today, the network is a permission network ran by those governing council members. But in the future, uh, the plan is to have uh, nodes on the network be fully permissionless and fully decentralized. Um, members aren't compensated beyond uh, you know, fees that are generated by running network nodes. And uh, it's also decentralized across time. Uh, so uh, governing council members can actually only uh, serve two three-year terms. And members on our governing council uh, consists of the folks listed here, uh, DLA, Piper, Google, Boeing, um, Magalu, folks located uh, all around the world. And uh, as mentioned, they all own an equal share of Hedera Hashgraph and they're required to run uh, an operation, an operating node. Um, they meet quarterly to make decisions about the network. And you can also find the LLC agreement as well as uh, meeting minutes uh, on our website at hedera.com forward slash council. And we try to be uh, as transparent as possible about uh, how those governing um, decisions are made and things of that nature. And then here is just a complete overview of uh, the Hedera network. So uh, you've got the main net and mirror nodes uh, that are running Hashgraph consensus. You have the network services, the consensus service, and the token service running on top of that, which developers can access through APIs in a variety of different languages. There's the Hedera governing council on the left side there, which governs the network services and Hashgraph consensus code base. And then you've got third party applications and end users uh, on top built using those services. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Guy, and he's going to talk a little bit about their usage of Hedera Hashgraph. 
Thanks, Brady. I'll just uh, share my presentation. Hopefully you're seeing that okay. Yep. So, silence is good. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Brady. All right. So um, I can whiz through the first couple of slides since we've talked a little bit about it. And I'm Guy Harrison, CTO and founder at ProvenDB. Um, ProvenDB, as I said before, we aim to be a bridge between database technologies and blockchain DLT technologies. So we try and provide what the database lacks and what the DLT lacks and try and bring you a service that offers the best of both worlds. And it's used for provable storage of critical compliance, legal and other data. So Brady talked a little bit about the, the era of trust. And so I'm going to sort of restate that a bit in terms of sort of my world of databases. So we've been storing as a species data um, on some form of media now for around about 5,000 years. So this is a clay tablet from Mesopotamia about 3000 BC. Um, it's got um, financial data really, it's agricultural records of, of um, seeds and, and grains and stuff like that. And uh, we used other mechanisms too. Things have been inscribed on stone, but for the most part for the last thousand years, we've used paper. And paper has been very good for us. It's economical, um, it's portable, and it's easy to use. And although we think of paper as being an inferior technology, it does have the advantage, all of these technologies have the advantage that when you overwrote them or tried to change them, it was kind of apparent that you did so. It was sort of like hard to change them without leaving any trace. But of course, somewhere around about 65 years ago, we started using digital technologies. Um, this is the first five megabyte hard disk drive um, in around 1956 and five megabytes in those days weighed a ton. Here's four guys trying to move a five megabyte disk drive onto a truck. So it's amazing how far we've come. Disks have got faster, smaller, um, more performant, um, but they still have this fundamental characteristic that's a little bit worrying. That is to say that anything you write on them can be overwritten without leaving any trace whatsoever. They're designed that way. It's designed so we can very easily change data, change bits on the disk. And when we do that, there's no way to see what was on the disk before. So our entire sort of like database infrastructure has been built on stuff that's fundamentally insecure, ephemeral and easy to fake. Now, this has implications for security, for trust and compliance. And I'll just briefly talk through the security issue so the fact that these disks are so um, insecure in their very nature leads us to um, a solution called the fence in debt. We basically take these disks and we wrap them in layers of security. There's a database that's got a security layer, the application's got a security layer, the network has authentication, and there's usually a firewall. And unfortunately though, hackers generally break through at least some of these layers to get to the underlying disk devices. And even if they can't, break through sort of directly themselves, they can always target an insider who's got a, uh, who's got authority. So there's always a database administrator or a system administrator who's got the ability to change the data. So we can't really trust anything that's in any modern database um, uh, today. And this has shown up um, in a couple of sort of like very um, spectacular hacks. Carbonax, probably the best known one. What the Carbon Act team did was they identified inside large banks, admins, sysadmins and DBAs. They sent them malware emails that invited them to click on a link. Some of the DBAs clicked on a link, at which point the hackers got control of that person's computer. Now that they had that person's computer, they could get the database authentication and go straight into the databases where they inflated bank balance details. These were Oracle databases. They just created money out of nowhere, siphoned the money off, and then came and sort of covered their tracks so that later on the banks couldn't even work out which accounts had been manipulated. So that's the problem um, of, of security that, that arises from the nature of trustless or untrustworthy disk devices. The other problem that's a bit more sort of like in everyone's life is the problem of compliance and trust. So we live in a world in which digital tampering and fake news is absolutely rampant. Not a day goes by that you probably don't see something on Facebook that looks like a genuine news article or a genuine video or a picture, but it's been tampered in some way um, and changed. It's just too easy to, to manipulate digital information and change it and make it look like it's, it's the real thing. 
And so this creates a problem for us as a society. We can't trust anything. And it creates a problem for regulated industries. Most regulators, you know, most regulations like HIPAA or GDPR have guidelines something like this that say that you're supposed to be able to audit all the changes, um, including the origin date of data. Um, you want to be able to facilitate forensic audits, resolve any disputes, be able to sort of say that something hasn't changed and have forensic evidence of everything that has changed. And unfortunately, given today's data management technologies or the, until recently, this has been pretty much completely impossible. It's just asking too much. So of course, maybe blockchain and DLTs come to the rescue. I mean, at least with blockchain and distributed ledger technology, we have a system where the data once written cannot be changed and therefore cannot be tampered. And this is Brady outlined a bit earlier, this is part of Hedera's mission to bring this sort of trust layer um, within reach. And, you know, we're great fans of Hedera and uh, as you'll see, we use it um, in our solutions. Um, and so we endorse the mission and we're you know, right on board with it. But we have to say that no matter how good the blockchain or DLT is, it's not the same as a database. So when we compare blockchains and databases, we see very high latency, low throughputs compared with databases, limited amount of data storage. You, know, you just can't put terabytes of data on a blockchain. Um, transactions can be anonymous, but usually there's some sort of public record that's uh, um, sort of difficult to get around. There's no schema inside. Usually it's just key values. There's no sort of tables or document structure. Transactions are expensive. And they're hard to get started with. They don't support the tools that we're all used to, the you know, JavaScript frameworks like React or Java Spring and things like that. Now, Hedera has done a great job of addressing many of these problems. In particular, um, Hedera have, have solved the problem of latency, throughput and expense. Hedera ex um, transactions are um, almost trivial in cost and the the latency is is the best of any system, um, comparable system. But we still have the fact that the Hedera system is not a database and you can't build database applications on it. So that's where we come in. We want to solve the dilemma of having to choose between a database and a blockchain. And you see this dilemma playing out everywhere on the, on the internet. Should I use a blockchain? And most of the time people say, don't use any of these technologies if you can get away with a normal database. But on the other hand, if you do use a normal database, you've got all of the security and trust issues that I mentioned before. So can we have it both ways? Well, that's what we're trying to do with ProvenDB. What we have is a, a database system where the data is stored as sort of normal, but we keep all the changes that happen to the database. Updates don't erase data. We just create a new version of that data, a bit like GitHub if you're a programmer. And periodically we take digital signatures of that data and anchor them to a blockchain such as Hedera. And these signatures can prove hundreds of thousands or millions of documents in a single transaction, which makes it very quick and economical. Um, so um, as well as sort of like proving the origin date of the data, it also gives us the ability to create a sort of a tamper resistance layer or tamper evidence. If anyone goes into that data and tries to do a Carbonac attack, the signatures will break and you'll instantly know um, that there's been something nefarious going on. So how we're different from other databases, and I, I mentioned this um, uh, already, um, to some extent, we keep versions of the data. So we don't overwrite old data, we just create new versions. We have immutable data. So once you've written an element of data, we don't provide any way for you to change it. You can only create a new version of it. And the older versions are pinned to blockchain so that there's no way to hack your way out of that um, capability. We provide a tamper detection scheme that tells you if anyone has tried to sort of manipulate, hack through to the back end database. Um, we provide the ability to move backwards and forwards in time and view the complete history um, of your data. And um, we allow you to view and prove um, all of the changes and all of the timestamps involved in that data. So we think that this sort of capability lends itself very well to a variety of industries such as those that are um, involved in regulatory compliance, finance and accounting, intellectual property where you need to prove the ownership of prior art, legal documents where you want to prove say the timestamps of contracts, government records such as driver's licenses and things like that, 
and anywhere where security um, is paramount, where you need to make sure that no one can break in um, and manipulate the data. So um, I know I'm covering a lot of stuff here, but um, I'm almost at the demo stage, which will hopefully um, perhaps uh, paint a bit of a more intuitive picture. So ProvenDB um, architecturally um, consists of a core set of functionalities, the database service and the anchor service. The anchor service is what communicates with blockchains, either public blockchains like Hashgraph, Hedera Hashgraph, or private blockchains, maybe Hyperledger, and the database service that um, exists on top of that. And you can use the database service directly using the MongoDB API. It's a MongoDB compatible database. You can move a MongoDB application uh, on top of it with minimal or no changes. Then on top of that database service, we've built our own document management system called Compliance Vault. Um, and this is a user-friendly, no programming required system. And you can move um, documents into that system using the web, email, um, file uploader, and we're rolling out integrations with DocuSign and Salesforce. And it also has a REST API so that you can embed these capabilities into your own application. But if you don't want to store data with us, um, we also have access to the anchor service directly, and that allows you to do bulk anchoring um, and to connect to uh, data sources such as Oracle. Um, and we're just rolling out the Oracle connector um, this month which will allow you to anchor data that's held in an Oracle database if you don't want to move it anywhere else. I'll show you that in a minute. So, um, so we think that we're a good complement to Hedera. Um, we, we use Hedera as the default for a lot of our services because of the things that Brady mentioned before. In particular, the fast confirmation time makes our application quicker. No one has to wait for sort of minutes or hours for a blockchain confirmation like that have to do with Ethereum or Bitcoin, the transaction fees are very low and that just makes our applications easier to run and therefore we can charge less for them. And we're very happy with the stability and governance model that, um, that Hedera has. And we think we add to Hedera um, significant capabilities, um, the ability to anchor very large amounts of data in single transactions, the connectivity to things like DocuSign, Salesforce and Oracle, the ability to store data off chain. So instead of trying to put everything into the um, Hedera system, we give you the ability to anchor things that are held in other databases or, you, or our database. And our ability to integrate with existing frameworks such as React or Spring. So if you're developing an application, you don't need to, um, you don't need to learn a new programming language. You can just use the familiar MongoDB API and the frameworks that exist on top of that. We also um, dispense with the need for you to manage your own cryptocurrency. So we just charge in dollars and we manage all of the crypto that's required to anchor to what are all the chains that we support. So I know there's a lot there, but um, I'll move on to a quick demo of, of a couple of aspects of our system and then um, I'll give you guys a chance to ask any questions that you might have. So first I'll just show you um, the database service. Now, apologies if you're not familiar with MongoDB's API, this might look a little unfamiliar. If you do know MongoDB, it's gonna look very familiar. So here's the um, ProvenDB shell. It's just the same as the MongoDB shell. Um, and you can enter commands here, or you can obviously interact with the database through the various APIs that um, MongoDB support. And so here I'm just inserting some data into the database. Then I did an update, um, all very familiar, looks exactly like MongoDB. But you can see here that with every update, the version number that is in the prompt has incremented. As I said, we never get rid of anything. We just create new versions of all the data. And so as we keep working with it in a MongoDB point of view here, I can issue a find and see the data um, to two documents, Guy and Mike. Um, if I'm in the current version, um, I'm always seeing the data as it is at the leading edge, that's the default. But I can also um, change my version to a previous version. So here I'm setting the version to 14802, and now I'm looking at the data as it existed then. And you can see here that the rating against my name um, is 11 in the current version, but was 10 in that version. And so using this command and a few other commands we've got, you can see the complete history of all of the changes that occurred to any of the data in the database. Whenever you like, you can submit a proof. And a proof basically is um, hash signatures of every document 
in the database at that point, or if you like, just hash signatures of selected documents. And then they are a, sort of a Merkle tree is created of those documents and the root hash is um, placed on the blockchain. And so once that has been, once that's happened, you can go and have a look at that proof and you can see here um, the, um, uh, the URL that shows you where that transaction is in Hedera and also a cryptographic proof that associates the um, our hash with the hash that we placed on the blockchain. You can also get proofs for individual documents. So although I created that proof for the entire database, I can pull out a cryptographic proof for any individual document that was in there as well. Uh, and I can, whenever I like, I can validate those proofs and just to confirm that in fact, they still hold if I need to prove to a regulator or something that the data in the database was in fact placed in the blockchain at that particular date, then I can do that. So there's a bit more to the database service, a lot of functionality that I haven't had a chance to talk about, but that's basically the idea of version database that anchors its state um, to Hedera. Um, and so therefore gives you the ability to prove the integrity and the timestamps of all the data in your database. Now, the second thing I'd like to show you is the compliance vault. This is, as I said, built on top of our database service. And it's just a user-friendly document management system where you drag and drop documents in. Um, you can also send them in using your unique email address. So you can add this to an email train and just have emails sort of like automatically um, anchored to the blockchain. And all the documents in the compliance vault have a blockchain proof associated with them. Um, and there you see on the left is the document on the right is the proof that proof document contains the cryptographic proof of um, anchoring to Hedera. Um, and so using this certificate, um, you can demonstrate that you were in fact in possession of that document at that time and that it's not been manipulated or faked. Um, you can do other things in the compliance vault. You can export them out of the compliance vault, put them on a thumb drive, bury it in your backyard, come back in 10 years and prove it. Even without us, they're independently verifiable. You can share them via email and, and so forth. And as I said earlier, there's a REST API that allows you to use all of those features, including those um, certificate generations in your existing application. Very simple API, just put a document in, retrieve a proof out. Um, and it's sort of like it's the functionality of that user-friendly interface in REST. Okay, um, the other API that I want to talk about was Proofable, which is the anchoring API. Um, this is when you don't want to store data with us and you just want to prove your own data. So the CLI, a command line interface, it just works with files. So I can say create a proof in the Hedera mainnet for all the files in this directory and its subdirectories and it hashes all of them, um, again, creates a root hash and posts it up to Hedera and it happens very quickly. Uh, I can confirm later on that all of the documents or all of the files are unchanged. If any are changed, I'll just be shown which one has changed. All the rest will still um, be valid and, and proved. So you don't invalidate the proof by changing one document if you're doing a check sum of the whole directory and someone changed one document, you'd lose all of your proof. But here you've still got proof for everything that's not modified, um, but you can, um, you can easily tell what has been changed. And you can anchor an enormous amount fairly quickly. So here I'm anchoring my entire Git repository. It took about 10 minutes to anchor um, 4 million files. So um, that's a pretty high rate for um, blockchain anchoring. Okay, and then, um, uh, just to point out, that's the CLI for Proofable, but it also has all of that functionality inside um, um, APIs, so gRPC, REST, and SDKs for Node and Go languages. So you can embed that sort of high-speed anchoring um, inside existing applications as well. And then the, as an example of a connector that we've developed using that um, technology, um, I'll show you quickly the Oracle connector. This is very similar to the CLI we saw before and very similar to the database service. We can just, using this, we can just anchor data that's held within an Oracle database. Um, we'll create um, hashes of all the data that you select, anchor them to Hedera, um, and give you a proof certificate that you can use to um, prove or work out, you know, whether a database has been tampered with. Now there's a lot of advanced functionality here too. For those who know Oracle, we take advantage of flashback data archive capability. So we can look historically into the database and um, create proofs for 
old versions of existing data. Um, but in the simple case, you can sort of see, we can show you all of the different versions of the um, a particular row, contract 99 here, and we can validate one particular version, um, confirm that it hasn't been manipulated and write out a proof. And just to finish that up, what, what we do when we write a proof is we pretty much create a cryptographic proof that links the signature that we've posted to Hedera with the hash of the individual row in Oracle. And so that proof is a sort of like a completely cryptographic, independently verifiable proof of integrity of any or all of the data that's held in your Oracle database. And we'll be rolling out similar connectors for SQL Server, Postgres and so forth very soon. So that's, um, that's the end of my bit. Um, just to sort of recap, that's that kind of like architecture here in a, in a single slide. And as you can see, we're trying to make it so that your data, wherever it is, can be, um, can be given the trust um, that Hedera provides. You can get any of your data on file system in, in, in external databases, inside our own database service, emails and so forth. And you can get fast anchoring. Um, that will allow you to sort of use Hedera as a trust layer for all of those applications. And we're very happy to be working with Hedera. They've been fantastic to work with and we're very impressed with the technology. Okay, thanks Brady. Um, that's my show. Excellent, thanks so much Guy. We really appreciate working with you also. Uh, so it looks like we have a few questions that have come through here. Um, first one is from John West. Uh, can you speak to the cost of keeping uh, versions is their formula for calculating the incremental costs of applying proven DB. Um, yes, well, there is a. I guess there is a formula, but it's 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 reasonably obvious. So, in a database system, the smallest part of the cost is generally the disk storage. Um, the biggest part of the cost is memory and CPU. Um, so, uh, depending on how many versions of data that you keep you're just multiplying out the, the cheapest part of the database. So that's sort of like the good news on that. It's not like by creating sort of like if you had 10 versions of everything that you'd have 10 times your database cost. It would be more like maybe two to three times the total cost. Um, however, I will say that um, we don't expect you to use ProvenDB with all of its versioning for like a high speed OLTP, like an IoT application, probably that overhead would start to get a bit much. We do offer a compaction feature where you can take the versions between two proofs and sort of um, eliminate them. So for instance, if you had an accounting application and you closed the books at the end of each day, um, but there'd been like a, a hundred updates during the day, you can say, I don't care about those hundred updates. I just want the end of the day version and I'll, I'll dispense with everything else. So we have a couple of management features to help you with that. Um, I, but I hope that that answers it. it. It really depends on how many updates you're doing um, and um, how much disk storage um, contributes to your overall cost. Awesome. Um, another question from the same individual. Uh, do you have a data archiving function that has all of the same features? So read only pinning to blockchain as the live data. And I, I anticipate maybe that would be something for like like GDPR compliance, where you can prove that you you archived or deleted something as a user. Yeah. So yeah. So we we do allow you to export any or all of the data out of our system, and we have an open source tool that will re, that will validate the blockchain hashes. So the idea here is if if we, God forbid, went out of business or something, um, you'd still be able to take all of everything you'd proved um, and prove it without us. Um, so that that archiving definitely we we fully support that. Um, the other GDPR feature is we do also support a forget feature. So um, the hash um, that we place on the blockchain obviously contains no personal identifiable information. Um, you can you can redact the data that's stored in the database and keep only the hash. So it sort of keeps the proof, but it it sort of like removes the thing you're proving. Um, but it stops us from invalidating any of the other data. So the whole Merkle tree, if you're familiar with that concept, is still intact and, and meaningful. We've just got, as you follow the tree down to a particular hash, it will say, you know, I've removed this, you know, presumably for GDPR reasons. Cool. Um, are there plans to expand compatibility beyond MongoDB, maybe into other, other databases? 
Um, sure. So we're we're mainly working on the um, the legacy relational databases at the moment um, for sort of like commercial reasons, really. Uh, it, it's not so the API. Uh, we have a demo, like a sort of like a, a sort of a sample piece of code that works with Postgres that you could have a look at. There's a blog post that I can, um, you'll find if you just search for proofable Postgres or or just look for me, Jai Harrison on Medium, and you'll find all my blog posts. Um, and um, it shows that it's not very difficult just to use the API to write your own connector into uh, any sort of database. Um, but our general plans at the moment are to stay with MongoDB as the sort of like the our own database service, the one where we sort of like batteries included, if you like, um, and provide connectors for databases pretty much in, in order of popularity. So the top five databases at the moment are, you know, Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres and MongoDB. So, you know, they're the ones that we're most likely to come out with, you know, first. But if, if you're interested in any particular other technology like Cassandra or something, um, yeah, let me know. Cool. Um, and what other blockchains does Proven DB support? And for what use cases might you want to use one of those other blockchains over Hedera? Um, so we support Bitcoin, Ethereum, Elastos, Hedera, GoChain, um, and Hyperledger. And in the in the Ethereum case, we support anything that's Ethereum compatible, which includes um, some private blockchains like Quorum and so forth. Um, it's interesting. We started with Bitcoin initially, but honestly, you know, we generally recommend people don't even think about that at the moment because the economics are just so appalling uh, and the delay to get something anchored can be like an hour easily. Um, so, but if you, the reason why you might want Bitcoin is if you were say so sort of paranoid about the a possibility of a 51% attack on the network in question. So um, Bitcoin has obviously hundreds of millions of, well, I guess billions of dollars of um, of cryptocurrency and it's very, it's got a lot of hashing power and it's kind of like clearly, you know, the most battle proven blockchain. If anyone could have broken into Bit to block um, Bitcoin, they would have by now. So I guess you could sort of say, if you're trying to persuade a sort of like a very conservative banker or something, you might say, well, you know, it's worth waiting an hour for a Bitcoin proof because, you know, we know for certain that no one will be able to, to hack into it. But generally in the real world, I'd say that's not a, a case we see. And actually we haven't um, got anyone now using the Bitcoin anchoring. Um, so the, the, the considerations would be if you wanted a private, blockchain, um, if you're running somewhere in, a, in an organization that won't let you break out to the internet, um, then you're probably going to be looking for something like Hyperledger or an Ethereum um, private uh, variant like Quorum. Um, other than that, I guess it's all about um, the convenience of Hedera versus the maybe brand recognition of Ethereum. I, I don't really want to sort of like... <laughs> you know, knock any particular chain. I'm an enthusiast of everything. I'm a real technophile, so I love all technology. But um, Hedera has the best performance and the best price performance. And that's just the sort of like, I think, uh, objective fact. So, but, you know, it's also probably true that more people have heard of Ethereum um, than Hedera at this point. Now that might change over time, but right now, if you're going to choose Ethereum, it would probably be just because someone involved in the application had heard of it and they, you know, wanted to use it. Would the cost of transactions, if someone were to choose another public network, be passed on to your customer? Does it is there benefit cost wise for them to uh, um, choose? No, no, well, sort of. So what happens is we balance the cost of posting to the chains by changing the frequency at which we post. So in the case of um, in the case of Bitcoin, we will only post every 10 minutes at, at most. Um, and in the case of Hedera, I think we're posting pretty much instantaneously because of the, you know, the, the various costs. So a Bitcoin transaction costs us about $5 and we don't want to do that, especially on, on free accounts for, you know, unless we have to. So that's how it works out. You're waiting even longer 
for the more expensive ones than you are waiting for um, for Hedera. Um, and there are there are there are some limitations on um, uh, the number of transactions we'll allow on some of the chains without going up to a higher plan. But so it's it's more the but it's more the delay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and that seems like a benefit in itself then for choosing uh, Hedera on the back end there. Um, so how does how does authentication work with Proven DB to know uh, who's responsible for each transaction? Uh, does there need to be a separate provider for this? So we um, so the, the blockchain transactions are, are mainly being done by us. So it's our sort of like private key that signed the the actual transaction on um, Hedera or Ethereum or whatever. Um, so if you want to if you want to have a sort of like a a private key signature in your data, then you have to add it to your data before you send it to us. Because what what our what our transaction proves is the timestamp. Um, it does have metadata in it that associates it with your account in ProvenDB. Um, but if you wanted a sort of like a higher level of proof that it was you, a private key sort of like level of proof, then you would need to include a signature in your application. If you run us on premise, you can um, configure your own private key well, in two places, really, you can have every transaction signed by a private key, a, a sort of like an independent private key, as well as using your own um, wallet credentials. So you could, um, we could sign every transaction um, that was running out of um, an on-premise deployment with a private key that you generated. And obviously you could also configure it such that you're using your own um, Hedera credentials. So you could do that. Um, but in general, in the cloud service scenario, um, because we're not, because you're not signing, you're not doing the transactions yourself. The transactions themselves do not have your signature attached. Gotcha. Um, and does ProvenDB use the Hedera consensus service? And if uh, if so, is it using a third party mirror node provider or data API provider, or did you guys uh, did you uh, deploy your own? Um, we do use the consensus service uh, and um, we do use a mirror node, but I don't know which one we use. I'd have to check with the engineer who um, worked with that. Um, all right, I think that's all the questions that we've got so far. Any last questions by anybody? All right, and it, lo it looks like uh, someone from your team too jumped into the chat um, and dropped an email address for folks to uh, ask any other questions or learn more about ProvenDB. So uh, Ignatius at uh, provendb.com in the chat there, if anyone uh, would like to reach out, looks like you can do that. Um, and and of course, really if you want me directly, sorry, Brady, if you want me directly, I'm Guy at provendb.com. Cool. Um, awesome. Well, yeah, thank you so much for joining today, sharing your case study. Uh, it was great learning more about ProvenDB and I appreciate everybody joining today as well.